All right, good morning. It's Tuesday, April 7th. Grumpy Cat reminds us that today is day 136 of the school year and day 16, 16 days of remote learning that you guys have done a great job with. And his quote says, home is where the frown is. I'm frowning a little bit today. Uh, plenty of thunderstorms last night and early this morning. It's crazy to think that yesterday was bright and beautiful and sunny and now it's back to a little bit of a sad Tuesday, but we're going to do the best of it. Today, I want to spend uh, the time in this video talking a little bit about the Alien and Sedition Acts. These are two different uh, bills that become laws in the Adams administration, the Alien Act and the Sedition Act. They're lumped together. And you can see on your screen that this is the document that I created for you. It kind of is an outline and a timeline of what was happening so that we can understand um, why Congress and the president, John Adams, decided to uh, pass these bills into law and have a little bit of context and perspective. We're going to talk about their desired outcome, and then we're going to talk a little bit about whether or not these bills uh, were appropriate at all, and then the response to these bills specifically uh, will culminate in something called the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. I'll talk about that tomorrow, and you'll see that for the most part, really dissecting this particular uh, idea of the Alien and Sedition Acts and the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions as we move towards the election of 1800. That's going to be a big part of our uh, writing activity that I'll post for you later this week and won't be doing until next Wednesday. So a uh, general reminder to you that today on Tuesday, April 7th at 4 p.m., I'm going to do a Facebook Live session. I'll focus on Adam's biography going into the, uh, the into the presidency. I'll focus on the XYZ affair and the quasi war with France. And I'll also talk about the Alien Sedition Acts today at 4 p.m. So if you have any questions or concerns that you want to talk about, please tune in today at 4 p.m. or at least go out of your way to look at the recording of the Facebook Live session. And then on Thursday, I'm going to particularly do a Facebook Live session at 4 p.m. That's going to focus on the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. So if you watch these videos and you take good notes, you should probably do pretty good on your writing activities this week and next week. And I uh, cannot stress enough that you should reach out to me or Mrs. Wilson if you have questions about this information. I know that she's taken notes and that she's taken my class before. Okay, so let's set the stage right here. We know that... Uh, 1797, 1798 is the time frame that President John Adams is dealing with the XYZ affair. So remember, he is trying to stand up to French limit testing. The French were poking and prodding at John Adams because they knew that he wasn't George Washington. They wanted to see what they could get away with. And they were upset that uh, in the last days of the Washington administration, this neutral United States of America had gone out of their way to set up some really strong economic and political treaties with Great Britain. So by provoking the United States underneath John Adams' administration, France is kind of calling out the United States for saying that she's neutral, but becoming best friends with Great Britain. Okay, We know that John Adams uh, tells the French ministers X, Y, and Z, those secret agents, as well as the minister Charles de Talleyrand Perigord, that we will not pay them off with a bribe to stop attacking our commercial ships, that we were going to be willing to spend ourselves into tremendous debt to create a formal U.S. Navy, to increase the size of our army, to prepare for a war with France if it came to that, this quasi-war period. At the same time, Congress is going to take some steps that they believe are important for national security. The two bills that they're going to pass that are going to become extremely controversial are this Alien Act and the Sedition Act, together the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, first proposed in 1797, and then eventually um, they are signed into law, you can see here on this screen, on July 6, 1798, the Alien Act, titled An Act Respecting Alien Enemies. So it deals with alien enemies. Remember, an alien doesn't mean they're coming from a UFO. It means they're coming from another country. And then the Sedition Act, which is passed on July 14th 
a week later in 1798, an act in addition to the act entitled an act for the punishment of certain crimes against the United States. So that makes me think of things like treason. So keep that in mind. And then you'll see below the Virginia, Kentucky resolutions. We're going to talk about them going forward in the future. So we look at these bills and set the stage. Um, John Adams is very reluctant to get involved in these two bills. Remember, even though he's a member of the Federalist Party, John Adams does not see himself as a political creature with regards to Federalist versus Democrat Republicans. He does not appreciate political campaigns. He doesn't want the people's work to be done with the spirit of animosity or rivalry in Congress or in his presidential administration. It's something that bugged him with his relationship with Alexander Hamilton. You'll remember from yesterday's video. And he really doesn't like the way that he believes it poisons the American public. On a daily basis, he's faced with newspapers that either support the Federalist position, but somehow make fun of him because Alexander Hamilton's behind their writing, or he's faced with Democrat Republican newspaper articles and editorials that somehow accuse him of being a king and a tyrant that is more uh, worried about a relationship with Great Britain than protecting the rights of American citizens. And that bugs him. John Adams is a guy that has a very fragile ego. Um, he knows that a lot of people aren't going to respect the work that he does, and he knows that there's tireless work in becoming a public servant, and his job is to lead rather than to look over his shoulder or have big ears to listen to everything that is being said about him in a critical manner. But it eats at him over time because he really does think that he's not appreciated for the work that he did during the American Revolution, uh, following the American Revolution, um, and now as President of the United States. So I think that wears on him to the point that when Federalist members of Congress, and remember the House and the Senate are dominated by an abundance of Federalist Party representatives and senators, when they approach him with the language of these bills, even though this is not something that really fundamentally oozes something that John Adams would like to do, he signs off on it. And I think that personally, it's because uh, he's kind of been worn down by the negative things that people have said about him. And I think he wants to show people that he is a strong president at a time that feels like war, even though it's not necessarily wartime. So what are they afraid of? Okay. What are the Federalists afraid of? One, they're afraid of people coming into the United States and becoming new citizens that might somehow get involved on behalf of France. Uh, you think back to citizen Edmund Genet's attempts earlier during the Washington administration to get people to donate money to sign up to serve in the French army and the Navy. The Federalists are very concerned that these new immigrants that come to the United States from uh, former Caribbean uh, colonial locations that were affiliated with France or from France specifically, uh, or they just have an allegiance or an affinity, meaning they have an affection for France. Um, they were very concerned that they might get involved directly in helping France fight against Great Britain, or that they could somehow be hidden saboteurs uh, or secret spies working against the American Republic in the form of government. But but probably more basic than that, the Federalists are very concerned that new immigrants might come to the United States and say, well, there's two political parties here. Um, I want to become an American citizen. And when I do, I'm probably going to become a member of the Jeffersonian Republicans, which seem to be reaching out to new immigrants, seem to be more sympathetic to specifically France. You'll remember that the Jeffersonian Republicans during the Washington administration formed some of these friendship clubs or Friends of the French Revolution. They saw, specifically Mr. Madison and Mr. Jefferson, they saw the French trying to like emulate or pattern themselves after the American Revolution. So they, they thought it would be a good idea to be, be friends with France. Um, the Federalists are very concerned because if more new citizens become members of the Democrat Republican Party, then they might start to lose more state elections and they might start to lose national elections which means they might lose their grip on the control of the federal government and that scared the federalists who believe that they've been working so hard to truly fulfill the language and spirit of the u.s constitution so it's very much a 
both parties want to do something great in the name of the people. Both parties want to do something great in fulfilling the text of the U.S. Constitution. But members of both parties are disagreeing on how to do that. And they aren't particularly pleasant to one another. Like I said, it would not be uncommon for cities and small towns to have three or four newspapers. Um, and these papers to be specifically uh, leaning towards Federalist cement sentiment or Democrat-Republican sentiment. You know, today, sometimes um, Fox News is, is labeled a Republican news station or extremely conservative, and CNN and MSNBC are somehow um, linked to being de uh, uh, supporting Democrat issues or Democrat candidates or more liberal perspective on the news. Um, this is not even that indirect. It's not like people saying, well, I think that Fox News supports conservative issues, or I think CNN supports liberal issues. These newspapers would be specifically supported by the Federalist Party or the Democrat Republican Party. And they are saying horrible things about each other. They're saying horrible things about uh, each other's perspective. And I think that that wears on John Adams as well. Okay, so that's kind of the climate and the background behind it. So What's in these bills? Well, you can you can break them down specifically if you want. Um, they're not that difficult to read. I kind of want to just paraphrase some of the big points. Here's the Alien Act. You can see it's not that big. You can look at. And you can look at the Sedition Act as well. It's also not that big either. But you probably want me to kind of just tell you what's in it. And that's fine. If you want to quote these for your writing res um, responses, an easy Google search is just to search for Avalon Project and type in Alien and Sedition Acts. This is a digital archive from Yale Law School, and they specifically archive uh, and transcribe primary documents that are important to American history for the study of constitutional law and theory. So you're using some graduate school resources here, and I think you're very capable of handling them. If you look on the document that I created for you underneath the key components, you'll see that the one thing that Congress, and these are Federalists in Congress that have majorities in the House and Senate, they want to change residency requirements. So how long does it take to become a U.S. citizen for newly arriving immigrants? Well, the language previously said five years. Now they want to take, they want to change that to 14 years so that if someone comes here from France, they are not going to be able to become American citizens for 14 years, which means even though they might support the Democrat Republicans, they're not going to be able to hold office or vote for Democrat Republican candidates. Two, Congress is going to authorize the President of the United States to imprison or deport aliens, so people here from other countries that have not yet become citizens, considered, quote, dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States. So they're authorizing the president of the United States to use his executive power to round up and deport people that, quote, are labeled dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States. Now, that seems like an important power for a wartime president. But the Democrat Republicans are going to say, well, you're giving full discretion and authority on what defines someone as dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States to the president of the United States. So Democrat Republicans, like Mr. Madison and Mr. Jefferson, are going to claim that this is a broad expansion of presidential power that's unneeded and unnecessary. And what it's going to result in is essentially rounding up people that are that are living peaceably in the United States, that are off, that are trying to use their constitutional rights, like in the Bill of Rights, like their First Amendment freedom of speech to participate in their new republic, and they're just going to be systematically rounded up and kicked out of the country because the president of the United States doesn't like them or doesn't agree with their politics or their point of view. So this is seen as a dangerous expansion of the presidency, and it's going to become a rallying point by the Democrat Republicans later on saying, no president deserves this type of unchecked power, and shame on the Federalists in Congress for doing this. Okay, Congress is also going to restrict or limit speech that is overly critical of the federal government's policies and actions, and that connects to individual citizens. So Congress is going to give the executive branch the ability to censure, um, fine, 
and lock up individuals in prison that are overly critical of the federal government. So you might be thinking, well, citizens need to be obedient to the federal government's laws. And citizens need to be compliant with what their leaders are saying. And Mr. Madison and Mr. Jefferson would say, that's not this. This is not a question of should citizens listen to their elected leaders. It's not. It's beyond that. And here's why. You can't forget that the Federalist Party controls most of the members of the judicial branch, so nominees to the Supreme Court and other federal courts. They control majorities in the House of Representatives and the Senate, and they control the Office of President of the United States. Now, Mr. Jefferson is still at this point the Vice President of the United States, but we know from our study of the U.S. Constitution that the Vice President really doesn't have a lot of direct constitutional power and authority. So Democrat Republicans are saying, when you're saying that Congress has the power to prevent or discourage or fine or lock up people that are overly critical of the federal government during this period of war, quasi-war with France, what you're really saying, and this is important, what you're really saying is this Congress, dominated by Federalists, and this president, a Federalist, and this judicial branch, dominated by Federalist appointees, are going to have the power to punish Democrat Republicans, because Clearly, that's what it's named at. You're not naming us specifically, but the people that are critical of your action are citizens that don't agree with the Federalist perspective. So they are going to claim that this is unconstitutional because it is essentially persecuting, persecuting the opinions and rights of a minority party, a minority faction, a minority group of people by the majority in power. They're also going to say that this is going to be a constitutional infringement on people's First Amendment rights. Okay, You'll see that the motivating factors are things that I've already talked about here. So the goals, without saying it out loud, the Federalists do want to weaken the influence of the Democrat Republicans, those Jeffersonian Republicans that they were sometimes called. They want to make sure that they stay in power. They also want to minimize the influence of newly arriving immigrants in elections by increasing the time that it takes for people that come to the United States to become citizens from five to 14 years. That's a huge period of time. And they also want to disrupt any potential bonds that any American citizens or aliens in the United States have with the French government. Remember, this is still during the quasi war with the uh, with France, with the United States Navy and United States government. Now, a couple things. We know that President John Adams eventually is going to come to some terms of, of peace with the French, and we're going to scale back hostilities with the French, and we're going to get back to a status of peacetime. And John Adams really does think that that's one of his most important things that he does for the people of the United States. He stirs off, he steers off a possible war with France that he knows that we're not ready for. And he's very proud of that. Um, Federalist Party leaders like Alexander Hamilton are going to accuse him of being coward and weak because they think it's a great opportunity to, to have a war, to rally the American people around the flag, the American flag, to, to defeat a vulnerable French army and Navy during the French Revolution, and to really establish ourselves on the global stage as a power that shouldn't be messed with. So Adams is going to be celebrated by those that didn't want to go to war. And he's going to be condemned by largely a lot of members of his own political party. And that's one of the influences that is going to affect his eventual um, defeat in the election of 1800 uh, to Thomas Jefferson. But the thing to, to think about is, is this. The Federalists do not overturn these policies once this quasi-war is over with France. Um before 1799, things appear to be calming down to the point where it doesn't look like we're really going to have a war with France, and it doesn't look like these bills are necessary, but yet John Adams does not challenge Congress to get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts. And I guess what he could have done is not uh, pay attention to them, not take care that the laws be faithfully executed, but he actually does have executive agencies uh, arrest and detain 
plenty of people that are Democrat, Republican newspaper editors. A famous Supreme Court case that you can look at is the United States versus Thomas Cooper, C-O-O-P-E-R, the United States versus Thomas Cooper. I believe Thomas Cooper was a lawyer and a newspaper editor in Pennsylvania for a newspaper um, that was affiliated with the Democrat Republican Party. You can look at that. I don't want to spoil the outcome for you. However, there was one member of Congress, and I want to show that to you, a man by the name of Matthew Lyon, L-Y-O-N. He's sometimes called the Spittin' Lion, uh, and there is a, a parody um, Twitter account you can look at, the Spittin' Lion, L-Y-O-N, of Vermont. Uh, the picture right here that I'm, that I'm kind of highlighting uh, with my mouse cursor is a depiction of Matthew Lyon getting in a fight on the floor of the House of Representatives with the Federalist, Mr. Roger Griswold of Connecticut. So these two guys, Connecticut and Vermont, relatively close bedfellows, they're neighbors on our map in New England. Uh, these two gentlemen are from opposing political parties. One's a Federalist, one's a Democrat Republican. Um, Matthew Lyon is the guy with the pokers chasing Thomas Griswold. So he's already a fiery individual. He's actually arrested and locked up while he's a sitting member of Congress for uh, accusing the President of the United States. Here we go. Quote, accusing President John Adams of having a, quote, unbounded thirst for ridiculous pumps. So essentially, he's accusing um, John Adams of, of acting like a tyrant king, a monarch. And he is detained and locked up as a member of the House of Representatives indefinitely. Now, you'll remember that the U.S. Constitution protects members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, from being persecuted or punished uh, for their comments made on the floor as active members of Congress. So this is extremely controversial. Uh, Matthew Lyon actually... Uh, still is a member of the House of Representatives while he's detained. And even after he's kicked out of the Congress, the people of Vermont re-elect him while he's in prison, waiting for his jail term to expire. And uh, he also is going to become a very important uh, person for us in our story for the election of 1800, as he eventually will cast uh, a deciding ballot that helps Thomas Jefferson maneuver to a position where he can be selected as president of the United States by the House of Representatives. It sounds weird. We're going to talk about that. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. It happened twice within our first 50 years of existence, and that's why we've kind of changed the way our electoral college and the way that our balloting for presidents and vice presidents in the United States work. Okay, So I want to give you a little bit of a taste of Matthew Lyon right there. He's a fun character. Um, where we will be going is the study of the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. These are gonna be the Democrat Republican response to the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, there's some stuff in here that as you would you can imagine, really does uh, respond appropriately to the Alien and Sedition Acts. And there's gonna be some controversial stuff in these two resolutions that are secretly written by Thomas Jefferson and Mr. Madison, and then they are introduced to the state legislatures of Kentucky and Virginia to be adopted as kind of a, we're going to stand up to the federal government underneath the scourge of the Federalist leadership. So uh, to recap, the Federalists really do have some uh, national security concerns. I, I think those are legit. I think that they really are concerned that they want to give the president of the United States the ability to appropriately respond during a wartime crisis. I also think there are plenty of political goals involved here in punishing the Democrat Republicans or weakening them. However, I don't think um, that they acted appropriately in enforcing the Alien and Sedition Acts. I think they erred more on the side of political nature rather than practical reality. And for that, you're going to find that this is one of the big controversial elements of the Adams administration that uh, is going to haunt his legacy for some time, including now, including now. When you talk about John Adams, this is one thing that, uh, that people are really going to point out, and they're going to be critical of President Adams' uh, participation in signing these bills into law and then enforcing them. 
um, even after the end of the quasi war with France. Okay. Uh, that is the end of the presentation for today. Please remember that at 4 p.m. we're going to have a Facebook live session that you are welcome to participate in. In the meantime, please feel free to send me your questions or concerns. You should have enough information from yesterday's video and today's to probably be halfway done with your questions that are due by Friday at midnight. I hope you're having a great day. Find some sunshine in this gloomy weather and make sure to be kind to your siblings and parents as we go forward. And I hope you're getting ready for an awesome Easter weekend. Take care. Talk to you soon.